Hello, and welcome to the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios at the National Press Foundation in Washington, D.C. My name is Rachel Jones, and I'm the Director of Journalism Initiatives for NPF. And this morning, we are entering the fourth Widening the Pipeline Fellowship virtual training. The theme for today's discussion is investigative reporting, then and now. We are privileged to have two of the leaders in the field of investigative reporting to join us for our first session, as well as two other professionals who are leading the way in creating equity and access for investigative reporting. Our first session features Ron Nixon, and Ron was just named Vice President of News and Head of Investigations, Enterprise, Partnerships, and Grants at the Associated Press. You can read his bio by clicking on the link in your schedule, um, but his joining us today will give us some unique insights into the direction of investigative reporting and how potentially someday, if this is what you're interested in, you can join in as well. We are also extremely privileged to have with us Gene Heller. Gene Heller is an American writer and former investigative journalist. She is best known for having been involved in the publishing of the news of the Tuskegee syphilis study in 1972, and also in reporting that the U.S. claims of an Iraqi buildup on the Saudi Arabian border during the Gulf War was not accurate. So uh, hear, hearing from someone involved at this level of investigative reporting in American journalism history is extreme privilege for us today. Before we get to Gene, and before we, we discuss the Tuskegee study, I wanted to start with Ron by asking a question that I, I generally ask most of our, our visitors and our, our speakers, because I think it's helpful for the journalists in the Widening Pipeline program to hear this kind of context. Mm -hmm. Can you start by telling us about your own journalism background and whether or not you saw yourself mm -hmm. being involved in investigative reporting early on? Mm -hmm. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and also share a pleasure to share a um, platform with Gene Heller, one of my heroes. Um, so in terms of my journalism career, did I see myself as being a journalist? No, I actually majored in music in college. Um, as You see the guitar to my left here. Uh, but yeah, I majored in music theory and composition and never uh, thought about being a journalist. My goal was to write uh, music for TVs and, 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 and movies. Um, and I only got into journalism because I got an internship to write movie, I mean, uh, music reviews uh, for a, a black owned newspaper in Columbia, South Carolina. And um the way I got into this type of journalism was that I, um, like long story short, I was assigned to do a story about drinking and driving. And um, I ended up getting a videotape of cops actually beating a black man uh, and did the story. The story blew up. Um, I ended up getting a summons to appear in court to show where I got the videotape from um, and um, told my editor that I needed a day off so I could go testify. And he was like, no, we don't do that. That's that's not how journalism works. We, we, we go to jail to protect our sources. And I was like, hold up, time out. Like jail, like jail, jail. And he was like, yeah, we go to jail to protect our sources. I was like, dude, I, I don't do jail. I, I, I can't do that. So um I ended up quitting actually because I was just like I do not want to go to jail like every time I do something, um, and I went and I was a security guard for two weeks until um, my boss told me I had a great future in being a security guard, which scared the heck out of me. And I was like, "Yeah, I'll go. I'll take jail." <laughs> you know, <laughs> so. Uh, you know, going back into journalism, and this is the the type of journalism that I have have 
practice most of my uh, 35 year career. But, you know, again, never saw myself as being a, a journalist, period, uh, let alone uh, doing investigative reporting. I it think like you're running the entire Associated Press. <laughs> Congratulations on the, the new position. Thank you, Jim. Or the thank additional you. positions, I guess I should say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah thank well, you. I was telling someone the other day that they should have just shortened the title to Vice President of Everything. At yeah, I mean, that's a very, very good. That's what I'm going to call you from now on, Ron. DP <laughs> <laughs> slash everything. Right, yeah. Okay. I think our two speakers this morning are going to offer us a wealth of insight into the, the culture of investigative reporting, how it's changed through the years, and uh, uh, how we, we move forward. And so I wanted to quickly pivot now to Jean. Uh, I've told everyone, Jean, that you know I worked at the St. Petersburg Times for a three-year window, and you came, I think, right at the end of my three years. But uh, you were heralded. Uh, the name Jean Heller was was uh, just uh, uh, lofty in my uh, starting out as a journalist. But at the time, I had no idea that you were involved with the Tuskegee Syphilis Study. So it is in, an incredible privilege for me to be talking to you now. And so I want you to take us back. Well, let me ask you the same question first. Tell me about your start in journalism and whether you saw yourself as an investigative reporter early on? I didn't even see myself as a journalist early on. I didn't know really what I wanted to do. And my parents, who were behind anything I chose, um, said, well, while you're in college, and I was at the University of Michigan, why don't you get your teaching degree? And this is the way people regarded teachers then, which I, I hope has gotten better. Um, because then if you don't, can't decide what you want to do, you've got a fallback position. I know I don't consider teaching a fallback, um, but I also didn't consider myself a teacher. Um, I took two uh, freshman courses in education and I thought, nah, this is not, this, this isn't for me. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, first, I wanted to be an astronomer. And then I found out how much math is involved. And I thought, well, this isn't for me either. Um, and I went through this whole series. I wound up with two majors and three minors because I was bouncing around from subject to subject. And um, I, at the end of my, no, it was about the middle of my junior year, I transferred to Ohio State. Um, yes, Michigan and Ohio State, I know. Um, because they had an exceptional journalism program and I kind of wanted to try my hand at it. Uh, I didn't contemplate becoming a journalist, um, but I had I had been in high school, and so I thought, well, you know, let's see what this is all about. And I wanted to go, I wanted to switch schools anyway, and I fell in love with it. Uh, I don't know what it's like now, but the Ohio State School of Journalism then was staffed by professionals, professional journalists who were required every, every other summer to go back and get jobs in the real world so they didn't fall behind what they should be teaching. Most of them worked for the Washington Post in those positions, so they were in a, in a good spot. And I just fell in love with it. And um, I had some early successes while I was still in college. And I thought, there's nothing else in the world I'd rather do than this. And I told my parents and they said, hmm, well, okay, if that's what you want. You were extraordinarily lucky in that regard. And I want to ask you, what was your first uh, reporting position? Where were you? I was working for the Ohio State Letter, the, the student newspaper, when uh, President Kennedy was assassinated. And... I was just out looking for a story and I wound up in a bar in a, a black area of Columbus, Ohio. And I just sat at the bar for about two hours and talked to people about what they were feeling. Um, and it turned out to be a very emotional story. And at this point, everyone was speaking from shock. And so people were fairly open with me on how they, on how they felt. Um, 
And that story coupled with another one uh, won me a, na a national award, which was presented at the White House. And that got me public attention. So that started getting job offers. But I, I also had a graduate school fellowship and I thought, well, the job offers may will still be there when I get my master's. Mm -hmm. And then the Associated Press offered me a job in New York. Um, I was about to go to work for UPI in Boston. And the head of the journalism school was a former AP bureau chief in Columbus. And he said, you can't go to work for UPI. Mm -hmm. So he called a man named Sam Blackman, who was an executive of AP in New York City. He said, Sam, rescue this woman. Um, give her something to do. So they did. And I started doing radio splits, uh, which was not exactly what I foresaw as my future, but it was a start. And then I was transferred to the, the um, New York Bureau. And that's when I, that's when I really got involved. Take us to 1972. And I should tell you that I know Edie Letterer. Uh, Do you? Both belong to the Journalism and Women's Symposium, JAWS. Mm -hmm. And she, every time I'm in her presence, I'm just totally enthralled. She's just an incredible person. She is an incredible woman. But tell me about her approaching you with these documents, with this information about this study. I was with uh, an AP team in, uh, in Miami Beach covering, I think, the Democratic National Convention of 72. Um, I think it was Democrats. It doesn't matter. And I look up and here's Edie walking into our workspace. And I was delighted to see her because we had worked together and I liked her a lot. And I um, respected her and I had no idea what she was doing there. And she said she was there visiting her parents. I think she was on her way to a new assignment in London at the time. And she said, Somebody gave me these these papers, and I told them I'm not an investigative reporter, but I knew somebody who was, and she gave me the papers, and she went back to her parents' house. And the the papers were two letters that a, a member of the, uh, actually a summer intern for the uh, U.S. Public Health Service, now the CDC, had a job, a summer job, uh, counting HIV cases in an area of San Francisco. That doesn't sound like a lot of fun to me, but it apparently was important. And he had heard on the street about some study in Alabama where they were using black men as guinea pigs. And, and he, he wrote this letter to his supervisor in Atlanta and said, is this true? And the supervisor wrote back and said, don't worry about it. You've got a job to do. Just do your job. And I thought, that's a, why didn't you just say no? <laughs> that's not true. Um, so I showed it to um, the, he the head. I was then on the special assignment team in Washington. And I showed it to the man who was, who was the director of the team on the plane on the way home. And he said, they're taking cognizance of it. They're not denying it. He said, I, when we get back to Washington, I want you to drop everything else you're doing and just focus on this and find out what the truth is. And that's I want to stop I mean. you here because our next speaker will be focusing on the issue of the best investigations start with a single question. And it might seem innocuous at the time, but that question is the inner engine and the fuel. And so it sounds like the question for you was very simple. Why wouldn't they just say, you know, give them an answer or, or say no or whatever? Exactly. But that was the start of this investigation. That was. That was that was the question that the man who later became my husband, I, I told everybody he was the best editor I had ever known. And I wanted to make him portable. So I married him. <laughs> so I married him. Um, but that was the question. Why didn't they just say no? It's not true. So I want to bring Ron back into this discussion because I think this is a, a part of our today's theme as well. The culture of, of AP at that time was obviously probably, obviously primarily male, 
And so a woman coming up with uh, a, um, a project like this or an idea like that, how was, put, put us in that setting. What was it like for you to be handed this potentially explosive project and you're a woman in this predominantly male setting? Is that, it's obviously- For you now, and then I'm going to pivot. To Ron, you. he doesn't look much like a woman. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I've been asked that question before. In fact, um, an AP reporter just did a big story about the 50th anniversary of Tuskegee. Uh, brought up to me an article that had been written by a colleague on the special assignment team named Harry Rosenthal in which he had referred to me as pixie-like and it was, I don't know, something else which today would not be approved. And I told him that when I read the article back in the 70s, I, I, I was thrilled. I thought, oh, it's nice to know that somebody thinks I'm attractive. And, and I never experienced any kind of prejudice about my gender. Um, I never felt like I was being compensated at a level below the men. I know that happened. I know it happened all the time. It just was not part of my experience. The men were as, as nice to me as they could possibly have been. Ron, I, when I think of some of the major challenges in journalism today, um, particularly based, if we look at America's, quote, uh, racial reckoning, and when I think about investigations, I wonder if we're seeing a bit of a pivot away from necessarily the the explosive reveal uh, in um, graft and greed to where we're seeing the use of data and statistics and deep dive investigations into inequality, into climate change. Is there a bit of a pivot or, or are we still the big dog or the big noise in the room always gets all the resources and the funding. No, I don't think there's a, a pivot. I just think we have better tools to tell the story with these 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 days or uh, better tools to do investigations these days because when you look at at um the kinds of investigations that are out there, you know, one of my favorites in, in the recent times a friend of mine, uh Corey Johnson and crew from the, the the Tampa Bay Times looking at people being poisoned and just lead smeltering near. I mean, that's that's a timeless story that you could you would have done in any era. Uh, or you look at the uh, stuff that the New York Times and others do with visual investigations, you know, like they did the piece about the, the US last drone strike in Afghanistan against a supposed uh terrorist. But the guy turned out to be like an aid worker. That's something you, you couldn't have done, like, you know, probably be hard to do that 10 years ago. Uh, but the tools allow us to do those kinds of things now uh, that we couldn't do in the, in the past. I think what is a bit of a shift in terms of, you know, in the, in the aftermath of the George Floyd killing is uh, a willingness to go mm -hmm. further and not just investigating the, the police or law enforcement down the road, but in the moment, because we have had, you know, been sort to of trained to, to defer to the police when they issue a statement, like this is what happened. And we, we sort of uh, take that um, as a matter of fact and, and run with it. But I think that that is something that has changed to, be reflected in our reporting in the moment now, rather than we go back and do a deep dive on it later and find out find out what they told us isn't true. Um, I think that you know there are efforts within the industry to actually have dedicated teams to cover race and ethnicity, uh, but the coverage of race and ethnicity has has been a staple of investigative reporting since there has been investigative reporting. You go from Ida B. Wells and looking at lynching or Walter White looking at, at lynching to, uh, you know, 1988 Bill Detman at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution looking at the uh, redlining by, by banks, you know, one of the first instances of uh, data journalism 
uh, being a, a a huge part of investigative reporting. So, you know, I think it's it's it wouldn't quite say we're seeing sort of a sea change, but the tools that we have today are better than they were in the past. But there are also, there are some changes in the way that we approach uh, certain institutions within our society, and in terms of the deference that we give them. Well, speaking of tools, let's pivot back to Gene and tell us about your your approach to this. When that editor on the plane told you, "Drop everything and do this," how did you get started? You know, I don't actually, I don't remember the first step I took. This was before, you know, you just go to the internet and look up anything and then don't trust it till you can prove it yourself. Um, but I, I did enlist the help of uh, some researchers who work, work for AP and they couldn't find any reference uh, uh, to to the study anywhere, and so I went to the library. Uh, I in fact I was in New York City for something else, and I went to that great big library on on Fifth Avenue, um, and I started working with a librarian there, and and we came up. She actually gave me the lead, and then I came up with this very obscure medical journal. I don't even remember the name of it. I'd never heard it before. It was nothing like JAMA or the New England Journal of Medicine or anything with that kind of stature. And they, they mostly did statistical stories. And they had done a couple of stories about Tuskegee, but it was mostly the Tuskegee, the, 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 um, the statistics of the study And the subject of the morality of the study never came up. It was treated as though this is something medicine does. And armed with that, I was able to go to the CDC and the U.S. Public Health Service, sorry, and say, I, you know, I want to hear about this. Tell me, tell me about this. And they kept putting me off and putting me off and putting it off, putting me off. Until finally, I said, you know, I can only give you a chance to tell your side of the story so many, so many weeks and months. Uh, It wasn't months, but uh, at at some point, um, I've got to do something with this. And I, you, if you're just refusing to comment on something this gross, uh, you're going to look really bad. I'm going to jump in here because you talked about the morality of the Pete of the study. As a journalist, we're we're trained to sort of keep arm's length or just report the facts and whatever. But tell me about that aha moment for you when you you hit upon what was going on and you realized what are they doing? This this is horrible. Tell us about what took you to that point in the investigation. I was I was absolutely stunned um, when they finally said okay they would they would help me and i knew that they, they were, i was going to get information from the point of view they wanted me to have to see um and nonetheless i suddenly knew it was all true and i went home and i sat down in the living room and i cried i um i don't cry that easily except it old telephone reach out and touch me commercials <laughs> but i um i cried and ray said tell me about it and i did and we both just sat there looking at each other I, it, to me it was it was impossible that um that this had remained a secret basically for so many for 40 years um and I remember one thing that really hit me hard was after the story broke, I was getting phone calls from all over the country from other journalists who wanted to interview me and talk to me about what essentially we're talking about today. And I got a call from a reporter at Jet Magazine. And I 
think Ron, Ron even you told me this. Somebody told me that as as a print mechanism, Jet doesn't exist anymore, but it's still got an online presence. Yes, that's correct. But that's that's really kind of beside the point. Um, I talked to this reporter for 20 minutes and then he paused and he said, let me ask you a question. He said, you don't, you don't sound black. I'm not quite sure. I know what he was, I know what he was saying, but I, I found the question offensive. And I said, I'm not black, I'm white. And his response was, then why do you care? Oh. And I was knocked out of my chair. I mean, how could you not care? This is to me. This was this was his problem. Um, to, to to be able to think in terms of the impossibility of one single white woman on this earth who cares about her fellow human beings, and I wasn't. I mean. It was just his point of view, but it was it 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 cut pretty deep. Mm -hmm. I have to open this up now. Do any of the journalists have any questions at this point for Jean? Because I could monopolize this and just talk to you all day. It, why would we, do I see a Zoom hand raised? Apparently not. I have a question. Yes, jump in. Um, hi, Jean. My name is Gabrielle. I'm a reporter from PolitiFact. Um, so a lot of the things that we cover, yeah. So a lot of the things that we cover um, have to do with fact checking and, and politics. You know, getting the uh, the accurate information out there. But we do also cover um, what we call enterprise stories, or you know, stories that like like you covered. You know, we really do care about. Um, what is the best way to pitch an investigative story? So, you know, having it flipped rather than the editor coming to you, you're going to the editor um, and saying, hey, this is a story that I want to focus on and cover. Um, you know, do you do your, your research beforehand? And if so, how much do you do before you bring it to the table? Well, I don't do any of it anymore. I'm, I am I write books now. You can right. see <laughs> shows on when you're behind me. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But my, I think what I normally did in those circumstances was rather than running right to an editor, taking whatever time I could husband and seeing what I could see so that I had something concrete to present when I went to the editor. Mm -hmm. And if it was sufficient, um, I don't remember an editor ever saying no. And it was, if it was not sufficient, the editor might say something like, go back and find out a little more and come back and talk to me. Mm -hmm. I was never discouraged from enterprise report. Well, I mean, that's, I was on the special assignment team. That's what we did. That was our assignment. Mm -hmm. So um, I was, I was never discouraged from it. And um, fortunately so. Mm -hmm. So I would say, just make sure what uh, the, the solidity of the ground you're standing on and then go fight for it. Mm -hmm. Gene, that very powerful last uh, example you gave about the interaction with the Jet reporter uh, brings me to a part of this discussion when it comes to the issues of race in America, the deep fissures in our society and, and the ways that we view each other and, and the uh, opinions that we have. I want to ask Ron about the culture of investigative reporting within newsroom settings at writ large in terms of who gets the, the plum assignments, who is perceived as uh, being on the, the investigative leading edge. Uh, what would you say to these young journalists of color who might aspire to uh, doing this kind of investigative reporting, but they're, they're perceived in a particular way, they are put in a particular box mm -hmm. and may not feel that they, they have access to that lane. Mm -hmm. So let me do one thing first. Let me add to what Jean said about the pitching um, and the, the young lady's question about that. I would just add to that is that do enough research 
where you to show the editor that you have a command of the topic that you're you're pitching. You may not have every single thing nailed down, but it's enough that I know that yeah, you know that's something that I could I could go with, or maybe I come back to you and say, well, okay, I just need a little bit more information on on this, but always do enough research um, beforehand. Because if you just pitch me, I want to look at the answer is probably always going to be no. Because, you know, we, even though we are investigative reporters, you don't have a lot of time to like just have people go look at stuff, right? And particularly if you're trying to do this while also covering a beat. So you want to have enough information to do that. Uh, and then, Rachel, in terms of your, your question, I, I would say this. Uh, where we are in terms of diversifying uh, investigative reporting, the, the ranks of investigative reporting, uh, it's, not, it's nowhere close to where we where we need to be. Um, you know, the teams are pretty homogenous across the industry in a lot of ways, but I will say that they are they are changing, uh, and more people are being given the opportunity to to do this. And one I think is because you have different leaderships now than you ha had in the past. I mean, there's people like myself in positions that are able to hire people who, you know, different than, than what people traditionally think of as an investigative reporter. Uh, and this is both for um, terms of gender and, and race, right? Like it, it has traditionally been a white male dominated uh, industry and it's it's changing to, to a large degree. But so what I would say is, is that if you want to do this type of work, pursue this type of work, right? Because again, you have a um, a failed musician here who uh, is doing, you know, investigative work, right? Yeah, exactly. Right? So, and and I think that you know that speaks speaks volumes, but. Um, you, you look at somebody like uh, Dean Bacade, uh, who was the, the editor of the New York Times until recently. Dean was an investigative reporter. Um, you know, the AP, when it was when it first started its, its investigative team, uh, was unique in a lot of ways because it had Gene on the team, uh, but it had African-American on the team, too, which was like highly unusual for those for those those times. And and. And almost highly unusual today, too, in a lot of ways. So I think that things are changing because you now have people in positions to hire folks um, and give them an opportunity to do this. Because I think one of the, the, the things is that there has sometimes been a, a different standard uh, for people of color, uh, that folks are looking for the unicorn rather than giving people an opportunity to develop into this type of reporter. And, and I think that that is where we have to really look at this, this differently. But also you should presuppose that because, you know, people are, you have people of color that they're not as experienced as other people. And I, I, you, see, you see that sometimes in terms of people conflating diversity with uh, experience. You know, the first thing that will come out is like, well, you know, we you, you want people who are experienced. Well, who says you can't be person of color and be experienced? Right? So uh, I, I think those are some of the things that we have to purge uh, ourselves of as, a, as an industry and just give everybody a shot. You know, my goal is 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 that I don't look at this as like having a set number of people of color that I want to hire or any. I broaden the pool of people that I look at, right? Because if you're always drawn from the same little pool, you're going to get the same type of people all the time. You know, I broaden the pool of people that I'm looking at and I've hired whites, I've hired, you know, people of color, I've, I've hired everybody because I want the very best journalists and I don't want to miss anybody because I'm only pulling from the same little pool. Before we go can back, I, can, the, can I just add something sure, sure. that um, I wasn't an, an original member of the special assignment team. Originally, the team was set up 
so that they took some of the best reporters they had in Washington. One one man covered the House of Representatives, mm-hmm. and they were and they just moved them into a, a a slot that they called the special assignment team, and it didn't work. Mm-hmm. Uh, the man who was then a, then the head of the team was not able to get these older, more experienced reporters to shift gears and think differently about the work. Mm-hmm. And that's when they said, let's start all over again. And I was like 22. Mm-hmm. And they said, you know, and, and that I, that wasn't unusual. There were a couple of older people on the, on the team, but of my age wasn't a factor. It was my, my drive, my, mm-hmm. what history I had. Right. Um, and so you can, you can cultivate, an investigative reporter, if the reporter is curious enough and willing to listen and learn. Um, And my husband was eventually named the head of that, of that team. And he had an incredible people who worked for him. They loved him. When he left AP, somebody put a note on the office bulletin board and said, the ship is deserting the sinking rats. You know, and, and and that was just the way people felt about him. Mm-hmm. And so he was a, he was a teacher. Mm-hmm. Um, he was he was incredibly supportive, incredibly knowledgeable, and very tough mm-hmm. when it came to to dealing with those above him. Mm-hmm. So I, I agree. I agree with Ron completely. It, it, you know, looking looking for somebody to come in with the experience, then they're also they might also come in with preconceptions of what the job should be. Right, right. I see it. Amanda's hand is raised. Yeah, thanks. Um, I had a question um, for Ron. I was just curious, what are some of the attributes you look for in journalists when you are hiring? You know, what are things that we can be doing if this is work that we're interested in? You kind of already acknowledged it can be tricky to pursue something um, when you're covering a beat to pursue something more investigative. So I'm curious what advice you have and yeah, what you're what you're looking for. Well, in, in terms of uh, what I'm looking for, the first thing that I that I look for uh, is is ambition. Um, you know, I know people talk about writing and, and all the data, but just ambition. Like, do you do you want to to take on these types of stories? Do you have the ambition to do it? Because not everybody does, right? And it's it's hard work. Uh, and so some people just want to write what they want to do and just go home. Um, and there's, you know, my uncle, um, you know, I'm from Mississippi. And so my uncle uh, has this saying that, you know, the, the fleas come with the dog, right? So, you know, if you have uh, this, 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 the glory that you get from being investigative reporting, there's also the, when, when people hit back at you, there's the threats of lawsuits and that's all. And you have to recognize that, that there's a lot that comes with it. So, there are threats to your life. There's, there's, that's true, right? So I think that's the first thing is, 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 is a level of ambition, the ability to, to think creatively is, is something else that, that, that I, that I look at, um, and, and thinking outside the box, um, because you know this type of reporting presents itself in different ways. Sometimes you just can't get stuff, right, uh, or there are obstacles to getting stuff, but there's still ways to get it. And so I want to see h- how do you deal with, with situations like that where you're not able to get the information through the traditional ways of just sources or, or FOIA. Um, writing ability is, uh, but, but again, those are like, like technical things that I can, I can teach you. Like I can, I, if, if people come to me with a skill that I don't necessarily have on the team, I can work with them to get them to a point where if I think that there it's worth the investment. Um, so I'm not looking for the, the, the full package for you to, to come in that you're already baked and you already know how to, to do that. I've got people like that, but what I'm also trying to do is, is prepare for the future because a lot of us are not going to be here in, in like 10 years. So I need to have a crop of people coming after us because I'm thinking of the AP beyond Ron Nixon being here. 
So that's uh, that's kind of how I I think of it. I hope that answers the, the the question. And in terms of like you know how do you do this when you're managing beat? You know we at the IB Well Society we would do this session called managing and juggling. The main thing there is managing your time. Uh, and so while you're waiting to like uh, make a call, write that FOIA request. Uh, practice what we call the two notebook rule. You're on your way out to cover this fire, right? In your one notebook, write about what's happening like now. This is the story I got to do now. But then you have your second notebook thinking about ideas uh, that could be lend themselves to investigations, like how long did it take the fire to, to get there? You know, what are some of the, the 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 problems that you have? So, if 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 you do that, you'll you'll be able to do like investigations off the news, if that makes sense. Before I think a good, a good just real briefly, a good example of that, and I'm starting at the top, and I'll work my way. We can work our way down. Is Maggie Haberman at the New York Times, um, and she. What she does also addresses the, the question of money uh, and where do news organizations in this day and age get the money to support investigative journalism. And Maggie has become a staple on CNN mm -hmm. and she works she works for both of them. So right. the, for what two organizations are paying her, they're getting one of the finest investigative reporters in the country. Um, and I think you you got to you've got to have the reputation already for that kind of thing to happen. But there are but there are ways to get around some of today's financial problems with uh, new and all news organizations. Mm -hmm. Mina, you had a question. Yeah. Hi, Ron. Hi, Jean. Thank you so much for being here today. I've been learning so much. Um, I'm sure we all have. I, I'm at the point where like, I haven't determined if I want to be an investigative reporter yet, but the, with the current position I'm in, in the newsroom I'm in, I'm definitely seeing myself, you know, kind of go down that route, having to use a lot more investigative tools to do my reporting. Um, I cover criminal justice issues, mm -hmm. and I'm with Mississippi Today, which is, you know, very big on investigative work. We've been kind of leading the coverage with the Brett Favre, TANF related yep. scandal stuff. But, you know, I see my colleagues doing this great work and I'm like, I would love to be there one day. And I know I'm kind of being going down that route and kind of being interested. But I, other than like developing the skills or just having, you know, the ambition, like you guys mentioned, to go out and do it or just to manage your time. How do you do you have any advice for like just doing it and stepping into it? Because I, I feel like I'm still at a point where like I don't know what I don't know. But I feel like that could be, you know, the case with any position I'm in. but. Well, that's kind uh, of where I'm at that's, now. That's true for everybody. Um, I think one of the qualities you need to bring to the job is patience. An investigative reporter can get himself or herself in a lot of trouble by being impatient with the rate at which they're getting the story, if there is a story to get. Um, and you have to you have to postpone gratification. You have to be able to do that. Um that's the first thing that came to mind when you asked the question. Ron may have a more contemporary view of it. No, I I, I think that that's 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 true, and I certainly agree with that. Uh, I I think in terms of of like you know going down the road to being an investigative reporter it starts with like doing something today, right? Like if you cover criminal justice, that is a beat that is ripe for uh, investigative work and to step back and think about so if you're doing you know a story on like you know police frisking people you know or something video that goes viral or something to that effect then step back and think okay is, is there a bigger story to, to like tell here if the court system and you're sitting there and you're you're looking at um, person after person coming through that court system that looks the same. Like, why is that? Right? Like, could could I take a step back and find out like why why that that is? Um, where are police uh, 
resources deployed? You know, what is the makeup of the diversity of the law enforcement in the areas that 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 you cover? Do the law enforcement folks live in the areas that they patrol? Uh, you know, all of those things are ripe for investigation that you can step back and actually take a look at. So I think oftentimes we think that we need to find something to investigate when it's right right there in front of us. Uh, that if we just step back a minute and just ask the question, why is that for whatever it is that, that you're yeah, then you can find out like, well, you know, like for instance, like cities like pay a ton of money sometimes for for uh, police behaving badly, you know, to, to put it lightly, right? Well, how does that work? How does that end up? Because, you know, a lot of cities will say, yeah, but the insurance, the insurance, you know, pays for that. Yeah, but, you know, like for the rest of us, if we have a car accident or something, your premium goes up, right? Well, I imagine this is for the same thing for a city that if you keep having cops that you have to pay off people for it, your premium goes up and who pays for that? Well, the citizens pay for it. So how much did that cost cities to actually pay for those, those kinds of, of things, right? Um, the court system, you know, are, are people lingering in jail for a long time because they don't have the resources to be able to, to process people and give them a speedy trial uh, the way that they, you know, legal, uh, legal aid, do they have the resources to be able to properly represent uh, people who don't have the money to hire lawyers? So there's, there's just a multitude of things that you can do from what on the purse that you're on like right now. Right. So you don't have to look for anything. It's like it's like just right there, just taking a minute to just just uh, just just step back and, 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 and think about it, because, you know, just to just to jump on like the thing with Mississippi today uh, and, and everybody else who uh, is, is looking into that story. I mean, the one thing I wonder about all of that. Right. Which it's not necessarily the law enforcement um, thing, but like. Why is a guy who made over a hundred million dollars need five million dollars from the state? Like, is there a way to look into like his finances? Like, can we search like bankruptcy courts or things like that, or you know, a way into that 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 story? Like, I, I think that there's there's something something there. And the other thing I would say is always just like watch for like court filings. Um, and and do record you know regular record checks of, of the courts. You never know what will what will pop up in that. Look into city budgets around city, county, state budgets around law enforcement. See how much money is being allocated and allocated for what. Uh, what is not being funded as these things are being well funded. So again, there's like a, a, a just a ton of things that you can you can do from the beat that you're on like right now. Awesome. Thank you. Jean, as someone who has uh, pretty much centered her career on equity, um, access to, to resources, et cetera, when I think of the fact that you uncovered this story that for the following decades, everyone references this as a sort of pivotal or seminal piece of journalism that that uh, uncovered this gross inequity. Put it in context for us. From your perspective, what did your reporting on the Tuskegee syphilis study do in terms of health journalism, uh, equity journalism? Tell us what you feel about. I don't, cons well, first of all, I don't consider this an example of inequity. I consider it an example of second degree murder. Um, but how it affected me was um, an emotion. It affected me very deeply emotionally. Um, when the story was published, one of my colleagues, a, a white man in the, in the Washington Bureau of AP said, well, there's the there's this year's Pulitzer Prize, and I was, I thought, how can you even think that way? You know, it, it's that's inequity. Um, 
but it, it colored the way I looked at everything. Um, my first question for years, my first question was always why? Of all that list of W questions you're taught to ask, mm -hmm. my, my first one was always why? And I, you know, I still don't have an answer for that question 50 years after Tuskegee. Um, the study, a study, similar study on white people had been done in Sweden. There aren't that many blacks in Sweden. Um, why did they have to do it again to, to get the same answers that the Swedish doctors got? Um, why did they let the study go on after penicillin became a widely available and very uh, excellent, most excellent uh, way to treat syphilis? Uh, why did they let these people die? Why? You know, why, 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 why? And nobody's ever been able to give me a good answer. And I still am, I'm still asking that question as I just did. Um, so it, it, it gave me a, pers a perspective on my job that I hadn't had before. I hadn't had the job that long, but it also gave me a personal perspective to never assume anything about somebody who just because they don't look like me um, or talk like me or uh, act like me that I had, I, I had to get past. Well, I was, I, I, I was never racially oriented, so I didn't have to get past the color of people's skin, mm -hmm. but there are other aspects to being a human being that make you different from me. And I had to, I had to teach, I had to learn to always look past that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ron, do you feel that there are some investigations to be still be uncovered in the um, almost post COVID era? Are there some things that journalists need to be looking at and amplifying in their communities? Yeah, I mean, I still think that there's a lot to be done on. Um, the, the funding that was given out uh, in response to the pandemic. Uh, we're seeing day after day after day, you know, fraud, waste, and abuse in the, the PPP funding, the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, I think I saw some indictments the, the other day. But it's also what uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Topher Sanders at ProPublica, calls the circle back. We always report on stuff, but then we never circle back to see what happens. So I would say, you know, go to your neighborhood, uh, go into your communities, get the list of people who got the PPP funding and, and see where they are now. Like what happened? Did they, did they actually keep those people while they were getting this money? Did they, you know, did they lay people off? Are those businesses still uh, in operation? Um, that's still out there. I don't think we we have a good answer uh, or for that. There's still a lot of stuff around misinformation and disinformation around the pandemic and and vaccines and 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 what it all all means. So I think that there's opportunities uh, to do in, the, uh, in that way. Uh, and then just so sort the of politicization politicization of health departments in, in a lot of states too, uh, around the pandemic and how we, but I would look broader too to see if it's, it's because of the sort of reaction to the uh, um, COVID vaccines, are we now seeing people resistant to getting other vaccines, you know, vaccines that have kept things like polio and, and, and those things at bay for decades, you know, are, and you are starting to see some of those things come back like measles and, and all of those, those things. But, uh, you know, as we move forward, I think that those are, are some of the things that are still t yet to be, be answered. Like how has this sort of, politicization of the COVID uh, like impacted other public health programs. 
get those Zoom hands up if you want to uh, ask a question. Uh, as we wind down here, I'm, I'm going to steal a little extra time into our break. Uh, but Jean, tell us about what you're doing now, your, your Deuce Mora um, novels. Tell us how you went <laughs> from uh, reporting to now writing novels. Well, I'm writing novels about a reporter. Uh, she's actually a columnist for a newspaper in Chicago. And she she asks a lot of questions like we've been talking about here today and most frequently finds herself in situations she never expected and really wouldn't have wanted to find herself. And they they make I think they make kind of interesting stories. I told I was doing a book event last week. And somebody asked me if Deuce Mora was patterned on me. And I said, yes, um, she is. She's 34 years old. And the place just cracked up. Now, I took offense at that. But, <laughs> but then I, I had to push it further. And I said, and she's six feet tall. Well, I'm five one. So, um, but... The basis for the books are my experiences as a journalist mm -hmm. and taken to extremes. Um, they're, they're, none of them are is totally factual. <clears throat> but it's sort of where I can vent those old journalism desires. Um, I can I I can either either make up a situation entirely or change a situation that I, I I knew about or experienced um and turn it into a, a good story. And the um the, the books have just been um I just signed a contract the books are going to be made into audio books and digital books and um an agent a very well known agent in LA came forward and wants to represent the books for possible film or TV or streaming or whatever so i'm having a lot of fun with it and beginning to make some serious money <laughs> hey, that's not wrong with that um if there aren't any other questions i'd like to ask ron to sort of summarize this conversation by um telling us are you hopeful about the future of journalism when it comes to uh, put young people like the ones in this fellowship as they think of their careers. I know when you and I and when Gene started out, we we foresaw maybe retiring from our paper 30 years down the line and and being a columnist or having a very succinct um, mark in our careers. But the whole landscape has changed tremendously. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what can you say to these young people about making a commitment, whether it's investigative or whatever, uh, and about why they should stay in the game. Okay. Well, look, I, I, I think this journalism certainly has changed, but that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Like when we grew up, newspapers were, were sort of the, the core. Uh, you had the three networks, at least when, when I grew up, you had the three networks and then you had PBS, um, but I think there, there are, are more opportunities now in journalism in a way that wasn't before. There are institutions and organizations that exist now that did not exist. Like there was no ProPublica when we were, right? You know, there there was the only, I think the only nonprofit uh, investigative outfit was the Center for Inve Investigative Reporting uh, that now does reveal was it was created in the 70s but that was basically it otherwise you had to just do do like newspapers and i, I would say look the 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 industry obviously has 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 shifted quite a bit there's been you know we've seen a number of layoffs we've seen uh newspapers uh die um and i'm not going to sit here and, and and tell you that oh well you know that's not going to continue to happen. I think it will continue to happen, but I will also say that there are other opportunities in, in journalism and that 
it can be a rewarding career. It has been a rewarding career for, for me. And journalism does not always necessarily mean, you know, low pay and, and, and long hours. I mean, it, it can, and in a lot of ways it, it, it does, but I think there are many ways to practice journalism these days. There are many jobs that did not exist uh, when I was coming up in, 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 in journalism there again, I think it's gotten better in a lot of ways. Um, I think it's worse in some ways too, um, with sort of the pontificating and, and the blurring of opinion and, and news uh, has, has it's, and so like who's a journalist and that that kind of thing has, has, has had an effect. But look, I think of the things in my career that I'm most proud of, and it, it hasn't been necessarily awards, but the impact on people's lives. You know, I remember doing a story in Roanoke, Virginia, about a power line coming through this, the, the, the one black community in this county in Southwest Virginia, uh, that the power line just happened to be coming through. And, you know, after we did an investigation of that, they changed the, the root of it. And uh, to this day, you know, I still hear from people there. Uh, a couple of years ago, you know, we did an investigation into um, a young man who was imprisoned uh, as, a, as, a, as a 16 year old uh, for life in Minneapolis. You know, we did the story in January, 2020. In December, 2020, he walked out of prison. Um, and those are the kinds of impacts that you can have on people's lives, people who you've never even met, um, that you can have have impact on on their lives. And and I mean, you look at uh, what Gene was able to accomplish with the reporting on. I mean, it changed laws. It changed, you know, the the way that that informed consent of, of people in clinical trials and things. Now, is it perfect? No. But it something was created to try to prevent that type of thing from happening again, and that's you know what you most want for want is to have an impact on the society that that we live mm -hmm. in. Exactly, Gene. I would assume that perhaps the Tuskegee reporting is what you're most proud of. But please tell us in your career the thing that that you have produced or you produced as a journalist that you feel had the most impact. And that's your proudest job. <clears throat> well, you may you alluded at the beginning of this to a story that I did for then the St. Petersburg Times um, regarding the first Middle East war. Uh, we got a hold of some uh, satellite photos that were, I, I think at the cost of like five thousand dollars each that were done by a commercial satellite company in, in Russia. Uh, and they, they worked for oil companies and they were doing satellite imaging to help oil companies determine where the best places, places the most promising places to drill were. Fortunately, they all, the, a lot of the photos they got were of Kuwait, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia. And we were able to um, get very expert help from people who made a living out of reading satellite images um, to determine that the 250,000 troops, which the Bush administration was claiming were massing on the borders to invade Saudi Arabia after marching through Iraq, there was absolutely no evidence of any kind, visible evidence that that was true. You can't have 20, 250,000 soldiers and not have backup. Somebody's got to feed them. Somebody's got to uh, keep the tanks in good repair. Some, there's got to be an ammunition dump. Um, that's, there's, there was nothing like that. And all of the roads that led through Kuwait to the Saudi border, border were blocked by blowing sand. There were no tracks. There were no tank, tank tracks in the, in the sand. If you were flying over North Africa today, you could still see the tracks made in the sand by Rommel's army in the, in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, they don't just disappear overnight. Um, 
And I'm, I, I didn't change anything, but I'm pretty proud of the story. Mm-hmm. Absolutely fascinating. Well, I'd like to take this opportunity to express my deep, deep gratitude to both Ron Nixon and Bob for joining the Widening the Pipeline journalists in this discussion of investigative reporting then and now. And we hope that we can reach out to you in the future. For yes, absolutely. absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you. Good luck. Good luck to everybody. Yes, take care. All right. Take Bye-bye. care.